what world car has grown two more doors? Stay with us and find out on Motor Week. Television's automotive magazine with your host John Davis. Welcome to Motor Week. I'm glad you're with us. This is a television series for people who love cars and for those of you who just like to find out a bit more about them. Each week we'll have our own road test of new models. Our chief mechanic Pat Goss will tell us how to keep our cars in good repair and Joyce Braga will give us a close look at other new products on the automotive scene. So let's get things moving now with our first Motor Week road test. For months now, you've probably been hearing the term world car. Well, that's the auto industry's name for a car that's put together in different countries from parts made all over the world. The best known of these has to be the Ford Escort. It's currently the top selling car in America. The basic Escort starts at $5,500, but can climb to the near $10,000 mark with options. The subcompact comes with a European-designed 1.6-liter four-cylinder engine and a Japanese-designed four-speed overdrive manual, or an American automatic. The front-drive Escort was all new in 1981, and for 1982, Ford has made a number of refinements. Such as what, you might ask? Well, come along with us now and find out. In 1981, the Ford Escort and its twin, the Mercury Lynx, were available in both a two-door hatchback and a four-door station wagon. What's new this time around are two more doors for the hatchback. This is the Escort four-door, the model that Ford hopes will entice a lot of families who hate crawling over each other to fit into a small car. Our car was the very top of the line GLX, but it did come with the standard manual transmission. That's the most popular choice. Ford seems to have taken the styling of an Econo box about as far as it can go. The so-called two-box design, one box for the engine and one for the people, has been wind tunnel smoothed. The hood is sloped and the fenders are rounded. The tail has what looks like a mini truck. Actually, it's a wind cheating spoiler that Ford claims reduces wind resistance and improves fuel economy. Open the door and the interior says, I'm a small Ford. There are, however, a lot of Japanese and European touches for comfort and practicality, such as the front bucket seats. They're firm, offer very good side and back support, and they're fully reclinable. All our drivers, from short to tall, were able to find a seating position that was just right. There is one complaint. Every time I released the clutch pedal, my knee hit the window crank handle. Visibility, on the other hand, was quite good, despite the fact that many of us felt that the rear-view mirror was much too small and the front window pillars too wide. Since it's a Ford, the dash can also best be described as convenient. Our Escort has the optional gauge package, a temperature gauge, and a tachometer. All instruments were clear, and the gauges had white numbers on black faces. The rest of the dash is single-tone plastic, and to most seemed a bit bare. I expected the manual shifting Escort to accelerate a bit better than it did. But as I picked up speed, the car seemed to find some spirit. That led us to the impression that the car responds best above 2,500 RPM. But this is not a fast car. On hills, you long for a five-speed transmission. In many cases, third was too high and second too low. Ford intends to have a close ratio four-speed on the market this year, and a five-speed is probably not very far behind. Ride was difficult to judge. Your first impression is too soft. But in corners, the Escort leans very little, and bumps were soaked up quickly. The steering, it was a joy. It was precise and had good road feel. Now for a more detailed analysis, let's turn the car over to our testing staff. First on their agenda is a test for passing acceleration. That's how fast a car moves from 40 to 55 miles per hour. Even at these speeds, the Escort doesn't respond as well as we'd like. It took a slow six seconds. Five or less would be better. You expect small cars to be maneuverable, and you can gauge this by the diameter of their turning circle. The Escort took 36 feet curb to curb, not as tight as we expected. 
Our handling course simulates emergency lane changing. The pylons represent a two-lane highway, and all drivers enter the course at 35 miles per hour. They can exit the course at whatever speed feels safe for each car. Most manage 40 to 45 exit speeds. That's a good showing. The Escort was a fine handler. It was competent, secure, with good control, and little body lean. The only gremlin was a quite noticeable amount of torque steer. That's the tendency for the steering wheel to pull to one side when you lift your foot off the gas. That's a trait of front-wheel drive cars. We put all the cars through a series of braking tests, first from 30 miles per hour. After six stops, the Escort four-door average was 45 feet. A good showing, but nothing special. Braking from 55 to zero gets more interesting. Here we can really tell what the brakes are like. The Escort averaged 141 feet in our six stops. Again, an okay performance. On the other hand, the brakes felt very secure. They had no fade, and there was only a little bit of nose diving to let you know that the stop was abrupt. Open the hood of our loaded Escort, and you have to be amazed at how much hardware they can put into a small space. Front-wheel drive cars are complex. On the Escort, you can reach the spark plugs, distributor, and dipsticks, all right. But any service to the front of the engine, especially to the accessory belts, gets more difficult. Although you won't have to climb over anyone to get into this Escort's back seats, you can't just glide into them either. Small cars mean small doors. The Escorts are tall, but you need to enter carefully not to snag your clothes on handles and ashtrays. Once in, the knee, leg, and headroom are more than adequate for all but the longest trips. Under the large hatch lies a deep, if narrow, trunk. Our standard four-piece set of luggage fit easily. Grocery bags are also no problem. And with little effort, the rear seat folds down to provide the space of a small station wagon. The Escort's temporary spare tire is located under the rear cargo floor, and the jack we found was adequate. If you're a first-time tire changer, you should allow about 24 minutes to change a flat, and we found that a reasonable amount of time. The Escort is designed to deliver good gas mileage, and it does. For this 2,200-pound car, the Environmental Protection Agency rates the manual version at 31 MPG City and 47 Highway. Checking the mileage during our test, we came up with a combined figure of 34. That's a good number for such a heavily optioned car. The Escort is fun to drive and handles just fine. Acceleration? Ford seems to have that cure in the works. As for now, owners tell us that get up and go gets better after 20,000 miles. That's what you might call a long break-in period. The Escort four-door hatchback. It's a fun and practical addition to Ford's world car line. As part of their effort to revive the U.S. auto industry, dealers and manufacturers keep throwing incentives at us to get us back to buying cars. One of them seems to appear every few weeks in the newspapers. That's rebates. They're factory rebates, dealer rebates, rebates on cars, rebates on trucks. Does all this mean you're getting a good deal? Well, it could if you're careful. There are different types of rebates, and they have different effects on the type of deal you can make. In the beginning, there were only full factory rebates, meaning that all the money came from the factory and none from the dealer. But nowadays, the factory often puts up a percentage of the rebate money, and the dealer must put up the rest. When the dealer contributes to the rebate, the money comes out of his profit margin. This means that to make a profit, the dealer will have to give you a smaller discount on the sticker price of the car. Why? Well, because you already received a discount of sorts when the dealer contributed to the rebate. Another factor. Full dealer-sponsored rebates are usually a misnomer. They are, in fact, discounts given by the dealer. On an $8,000 car, it really doesn't matter whether you receive a $500 dealer rebate or a $500 dealer discount. You're still paying $7,500 for the car. Now, there are various ways to receive factory rebates. You can wait for a check from the factory, and the dealer may write you a check on the spot, or you can apply the rebate to the down payment. But here's where you have to be careful. Some states do put a tax on the total purchase price of the car. If you get a $500 rebate, you'll be paying sales tax on that $500, since it's part of the cost of the car. If the car were discounted $500, you wouldn't pay any tax on that $500, only on the balance of the cost of the car. 
On the same $8,000 car, this would be the difference between taxes on $8,000 or $7,500. Rebates, they're optional to the dealer, and they may not choose to participate, especially if the rebate requires the dealer to contribute. Not all dealers need to rebate certain models, and they may feel that they can increase their sales and give better deals through straight discounts. So when you go shopping for rebates, ask how much the rebate comes from the factory and how much from the dealer. A full factory rebate is your best bet, that is, allows the dealer to give you the most discount he can allow, while the buyer still gets money back from the factory. When you hear the word rebate, just remember it's the final purchase price of the car that's important. And an important factor to us here at Motorweek is you, the viewer. That's why we want to hear from you. Tell us what you'd like to see in upcoming weeks. To do that, just drop us a line at Motorweek, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's to Motorweek, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Now, each week about this time, we go to our very own mechanic, Pat Goss. He'll be giving us some expert advice on maintaining your car. The subject this week, it's motor oil. Now, if you've ever changed the oil in your car yourself, you probably have noticed that there's a wide variety of different types of oil you can buy. But any good mechanic can tell you that not all oils are created equal. So how can you tell what kind to get? Pat Goss is about to tell us. Pat? Suppose you have a new car or maybe even a good used car. And you don't want the engine to start looking like this inside after a couple of years. What can you do to prevent it? Well, the one single thing that is most important as far as the life expectancy of your automobile's engine is changing the oil. You might even want to change it more frequently than what the manufacturer recommends. Ideally, you want to change the oil every three months or 3,000 miles, whichever comes first. And by doing this, you can extend the life expectancy of your engine many times two to three times what it would be if you didn't do this. Now, there's a little bit more to changing the oil than, than just physically changing it. There are different qualities and different brands of oil. Well, we're certainly not going to get into brands because I don't endorse products or anything like that, but more important is the quality. And how do you tell the quality? Well, very simply. On the top of the oil can, or sometimes on the side, there will be what is called an API service rating. These are two-letter symbols. They start with SA, and they go through SF. SA is the least quality oil you can buy. SF is the best quality oil. SF is what is recommended and mandatory in virtually all automobiles manufactured since 1979. It's also the best oil you can use for just about any car. So if you have any question about it, always look for SF on the top of the can. Now, don't confuse this with what we see on the top of this one. It says SAE 10W40. Now, this has nothing to do with the quality of the oil. All this is dealing with is the weight or the thickness of the oil. Follow the owner's manual for what's recommended for your particular automobile and use the SAE oil that is recommended for the type of driving and the temperature and so on. Be very careful that you don't mix these up, however. Now, you may find, if you start shopping and comparing oils, that not all oils have these SF ratings on them. You might find one like what we have over here. On the top of this oil can, it says, for service SC. It also says, recommended only for car engines built before 1968. So we're looking at uh, at least 10 years since this oil could be used safely in an automobile engine. Now, we also might have a can like this. This says SASB. It's been 15 to 20 years since any automobile engine could use this oil. We might even go a little bit further. Here we have a can, and we find the API service spec on the side of the can, and it says SA. Now, there hasn't been an automobile manufactured for many, many years that could safely use this oil. As a matter of fact, 
been probably anywhere from five to ten years since there was a lawnmower manufactured in this country that could safely use this oil. So be careful. Then, of course, we have a can like this. We look at the top of it. There's no rating on it. We start looking around the sides of it. No place on this can is there any rating as to the quality of the oil. Therefore, we have no idea what it could be used in, and therefore, we should never use it in any internal combustion engine. Also, I'm sure some of you will have diesel engines. The diesel engine is different than the gasoline engine, and you have to be absolutely certain that you use the right type of oil in it. Follow your owner's manual instructions to the letter as far as the type and quantity and quality of oil that you use in your diesel engine. Be very, very careful about this because on diesel engines, if you use the wrong type or quality of oil, you can very easily do $1,000 to $3,000 worth of damage to the engine, and you can do it in just a few hundred miles, too. Now, a lot of people also... They're very much convinced that they have to put additives into the oil in their car. Well, this is not the case. Now, true, additives do have a place. Suppose you have an engine that's making strange noises, or maybe it's burning large quantities of oil or something like that, and you want to prolong the agony. Well, that's fine. Buy the additive that is designed to correct your particular problem and use it. It may keep your engine running longer. But if you have a new car or a good used car, don't use an oil additive. It can, in some cases, actually damage the engine in the used car. It can also void the warranty, in some cases, on the new car. Remember that this is very simple advice and that by doing it, you can extend the life expectancy of your car anywhere from two to five times what it would be otherwise, and you can definitely avoid situations like this. By now, you should be getting a recall notice if you own a certain 1980 or 1981 General Motors X car with a manual transmission. The trouble can be found right here. It's in the self-adjusting clutch linkage. This affects Chevrolet Citation, Pontiac Phoenix, Oldsmobile Omega, and Buick Skylark. According to GM, the self-adjusting linkage can over-adjust. That allows the clutch to engage more quickly than designed. A sign that the linkage has slipped is an audible clicking noise in the clutch linkage itself coming up from under the dash. What does this mean to you GM car owners? Well, GM will replace the self-adjusting linkage with a semi-manual linkage. The new linkage will require owners to periodically raise the clutch pedal to strike a bumper pad under the dash. This will then adjust the clutch linkage, and GM will make this replacement at no charge. Of the 245,000 cars called back by GM for the clutch problem, about 47,000 may also have faulty valves in the braking system. GM says, and this is a quote, that it could cause rear brakes to lock up prematurely during a severe brake application, unquote. GM will also replace the parts free of charge. From across the Pacific, we have news from the Honda Motor Company. They have signed a proposed consent agreement with the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. They'll replace front fenders on approximately 700,000 Honda Civics and Accords built between 1975 and 1978. Honda has agreed to write to the owners in 24 so-called salt belt states and Washington, D.C., explaining a premature rusting problem on front fenders. They'll tell customers how they can go about getting reimbursed. Apparently, the affected fenders are rusting in areas where moisture and road debris and salt get kicked up by the front tires, the stuff gets lodged underneath the fender, and rust first appears in the forms of bubbles and blisters in the paint. Soon after, though, holes develop in the metal. To quote Honda, we are doing this because we want to satisfy our customers and keep them satisfied, end quote. For our second road test tonight, we turn to one of the largest manufacturers in Europe, Italy's Fiat. Fiat is a big name overseas, but their fortunes have been declining in the U.S. in recent years. 
The reason? Well, Fiats have been plagued by the public's perception that Italian cars are somewhat unreliable and offer unacceptable comfort for the average American. Our test, though, focuses on their entry into the extremely competitive Econobox market, the Fiat Strata, like this car here. It has a wheelbase of 96.4 inches and a weight of 2,100 pounds. And it looks pretty good, too, against its subcompact competition. The base price of the four-door hatchback is $6,400. Options on our test car included air conditioning, a well-designed sunroof, and an AM-FM radio, none of which are necessary for the true economy seeker. How did it perform for us? Well, let's find out. Here we have Italy's answer to the economical VW Rabbit. After a successful debut in Europe, the Fiat Strata was introduced in the U.S. in 1979. So far, though, it's not been quite as successful here. Like most Italian cars, the styling on the Strata is very unique. From the pointed grille to the off-center hood scoop to the round door handles, very little about this car says Econobox. As a matter of fact, the Strata was originally designed as a subcompact car, but the U.S. government, which classifies cars based on their interior room, calls this a compact car. In that roomy interior, you'll find an ocean of two-tone plastic, very Spartan and very much European. However, that Italian heritage does make for some confusing designs. Most switches were of a strange-looking rocker type, and they're only marked with international symbols to tell you what they do. I found it easy to mix up the headlight dimming and turn signal stalks, although on the left side of the steering column, they're much too close together. The instrument cluster consists of a speedometer, fuel and temperature gauge, lots of warning lights, and a real live tachometer, something that comes in handy for knowing when to shift the small engine economy car. Putting this little item into gear and taking off is a pleasant experience. The Strata is peppy. The nicely spirited 1.5 liter engine does provide good acceleration, and it has pretty good handling too. The only thing that I didn't like was the five-speed manual shift linkage. There was little feel to it, a fact that is not uncommon for a front-wheel drive car. And it was all too easy to upshift from second right to fifth gear instead of third, a most embarrassing feat. Once I was done, our test staff was able to put the Strata in even better perspective. Passing acceleration was good, from 40 to 55 miles per hour in five and a half seconds. The Strata also performed well in our handling test. Our driver said that the car felt tight, held the road well. There was a fair amount of body lean, but the steering was quick and precise, just what you'd expect from an Italian manufacturer. When it came to turning circles, the best we could do was 35 feet curb to curb. That's a bit wide for this car, but acceptable. Braking was another acceptable performance. From 30 miles per hour, the Strata took some 55 feet to come to a halt. From 55 miles per hour, our average of six panic stops yielded a figure of 145 feet. In both tests, our driver said that the brakes felt firm with no fade. Stopping the Strata can be done with complete control and no brake pad squeal. Under the hood, the Strata is about average for front-wheel drive accessibility. The spark plugs and oil dipstick can be easily reached. Also in the Strata, the spare tire is mounted under the hood on top of the engine. That feature helped make this little Fiat one of the few imports to pass the government's 35 mile an hour crash test. Because this is a hatchback, there's little problem with loading luggage. Our standard four piece set fit nicely into the covered trunk. And with no spare tire hanging about, you'll not have to unload all your baggage should you ever have a flat. And just in case you need even more room, the rear seat does fold flat for even more cargo area. Open highway driving in the Strata proves small does not have to be uncomfortable. The seats in our Strata felt more at home in a living room. Lower back support was a high mark, and like most imports, the seat backs are fully adjustable so that all drivers should be able to find comfortable positions. When changing lanes, you'd better use your outside mirrors. There are some rear blind spots, despite the otherwise panoramic view from the driver's seat. The mileage estimates we got during our test ranged from 24 to 36. 
The EPA says you should be getting anywhere from 28 in the city to 38 on the highway. All in all, those figures are kind of low for an economy car, but maybe that explains why the Strata is so peppy. It's geared just a bit more for acceleration. All in all, the car was fun to drive. We enjoyed it. It does have a few annoying things it'll take some getting used to, but if you're looking for a car that's a bit different, you might want to consider the Fiat Strata. And we think it's probably the most suited for the American market of any Fiat ever to grace our shores. Each week on Motor Week, reporter Joyce Braga will give us an inside view of what's new on wheels. Hello, Joyce. Hello, John. It's all yours. Thank you. As usual, Chrysler is ready to make a huge impact on the market, and GM is gearing up to stir in a new letter in the car world's alphabet soup. This photo is showing up everywhere, and no wonder. It's hot news. This is the new 1982 Chrysler LeBaron convertible ready for the street in spring 1982, the first convertible from Detroit since 1976. It's on a lengthened K-body platform with new quad lights and an imperial style grill. Our reports indicate a thirteen to fourteen thousand dollar price tag. You've probably heard a lot about the much ballyhooed J car, including the fact that most GM models already have a version, most, but not all. Come next March, Buick and Oldsmobile will also join the crowd. We were lucky to get these great spy photos of the newest two in the J lineup, the Buick Skyhawk and the Oldsmobile Starfire. This is the first time that every division of GM will have its own version of the same car. The major difference between the various models is in the front sheet metal. The first year on the market looked for the Starfire and the Skyhawk to have the original 1.8 liter drivetrain with minor improvements. By 1983, most of the J cars will switch to the new lightweight four-speed overdrive automatic. Now let's take a look at one of the new tools on the market. This is a palm-operated ratchet, and it works like this. This one is made by Davenport Tool Company. It's designed to get in those tight little spaces where there isn't room to swing the handle of an ordinary ratchet. The manufacturer indicates it can also be used as an ordinary ratchet by simply swinging the handle. And that's what's new on wheels this week, John. Thank you, Joyce. And next week, we'll be testing one of those J cars you were talking about, the Pontiac J2000 and a Honda Civic four-door. For Joyce Braga, Pat Goss, and myself, John Davis, thanks for joining us, and have a pleasant and safe motor week. Studio vehicle provided by Village Dodge Volvo Fiat Incorporated.